All right, I'm going to play the video. Good to go? Yeah. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Binnie Ludlow and I'm the owner of Binnie Fine Foods Limited. I supply to 45 outlets throughout the southwest producing Girati food and the video seems to have stopped. Okay, so while we're waiting for the all the recipes while we're waiting. have been taught to me by my aunties and my mum in particular since the age of seven and from then on I've never stopped cooking. The food and farming in the southwest is wonderful because the farmers take care with what they produce. If you have quality ingredients this can reflect in a quality product. I use free range chicken which comes four miles from my production kitchen and that was very important not just for the food mileage but also how the farmer looks after the meat and this is reflecting in my quality product. It's great to be recognised as part of the awards and I feel honoured to be part of this brilliant family of uh, food lo lovers in our southwest region. See if I can share. Okay. Hello, back. Right. I yes. would like to share my slides now. Is there something we can do with that? Yeah, that's so many. If you want to, I'll stop sharing and yes. I'll let you I'll let you share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we go. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Minixa and uh, you can call me Vinny. Uh, I live in Somerset and uh, I grew up in Bradford in West Yorkshire. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about, you know, my journey of setting up a business with very little money and like you guys may have already experienced that and how you can do uh, lots of things with so, such little resources and be successful and thank you Vosha uh, for letting me do this today and uh, I hope I will inspire lots of people uh, from my talk today. So um, I will start with this first slide, really, because um, one of the key things for me uh, when, when I was growing up in Bradford, uh, mum uh, taught me everything I know about uh, good recipes. Minnie, Minnie, are you sharing? Can uh, everyone see? Yeah, hopefully. Let's try. Hold on. I'll try again. I'll try. Let me try again. Yeah. Is that yeah, we, better? That's better. If you can just go to full screen show or screen share screen show now, that would be great. Is that, has that worked? Uh, no, you're still on the um, sort of like smaller view. So can you can you go to the bottom right? Yeah, that's it. Is that good? Yeah, perfect. That's great, Vinny. Okay, um, I've got a huge screen of everybody's faces on there, so I can't actually see the imagery. So I wonder if I can try something of all your images. Yeah, try that. Okay. There, okay. Hi, everybody. I'll try again. <laughs> uh, is, can you see the screen okay? We can. And okay. we, if, if everybody can just go on, if you're not talking, if you can go on mute, please, that'd be most appreciated. Yeah. Okay. That's kind. So my name is Binny. Um, my real name is Winixa. And um, I was brought and raised up in Bradford in West Yorkshire. And um, my mum and dad are the Innes by Mystery and Bunny Ben Mystery. And they moved from uh, Kenya, Mombasa in 1947. Uh, with my sister, Sunday Fallon, and they moved and lived in Bradford with my Massey uh, when they first came to this country. Um, I sort of followed on after many years in 1973, and um, and then from then on, um, you know, mum and dad both worked in uh, the mum worked in a factory, 
uh, in the textile industry and dad worked in the car industry and was a, an amazing mechanic. And I guess for me growing up in Bradford, it was about food. You know, mum always said that if you spent any money on anything, you know, you've got to make sure that you eat really well. And, and so that out, my upbringing uh, was really about eating well and cooking beautiful food. And so I think growing up, basically, from the age of seven or eight, uh, I was sort of asked to uh, take, you know, take some responsibility. And I remember making roughly, like 30 roughly a day. And that was my job. And that was quite a big job to do. Uh, but I did it very well. And and then I guess, you know, mum said that if you can cook, you can basically, you know, when you get married, then, you know, you won't have a hard time. And I suppose, you know, you, you sort of start to learn learn all the techniques. And I guess I was fortunate because mum was such an amazing cook. She didn't realise how good she was. And um, she had to learn by watching people and learning and listening to, uh, you know, her friends and, and, and family about how to use different ingredients. And when you, again, when you're with a very limited budget, I feel that perhaps, you know, you have to be creative. And I guess that's why I'm, I'm a little bit creative is how I cook as well. But what's amazing about living in Bradford and Leicester and Birmingham and all those amazing places is that we have fantastic ingredients. And I guess, you know, when you can go to, we used to go to a bubble shop in Bradford and, you know, mum would say, right, I'm going to take you in there and teach you how to select the, the uh, you know, the aubergine and choose the best ones and never get the ones in the top of the box and look inside and, you know, pick the best ones. And, you know, I feel really lucky that I've had that training and I, I call it training because without that knowledge, you know, people just get, you go to the supermarket and pick out whatever's in the packet. You never know what's actually in the packet until you get home. And luckily, you know, I was able to learn how to select things and, you know, and then obviously learn how to cook. Um, and what's wonderful also that when mum uh, worked in the factories, she would take her lunchbox with her and, when they used to have all their lunchtime or uh, breaks, all the women would come out and, uh, you know, show them what they were sharing their lunches and tasting each other's food. And, and I felt that mum was really good at taking information. And then she would come home and we'd talk about, you know, what she'd done in the day, but also what, what she'd tasted and all the recipes that she had actually, like, you know, had learnt. We would then recreate these at home me and mum, and then basically, you know, I've learned new techniques. Some of the recipes that she learned weren't that very good, but others were just incredible. And, you know, I've got so many in, in recipes in my mind yet to sort of explore, but I feel really lucky to have been able to have that knowledge. And I know some of those masses and aunties are no longer with us, and recording that kind of data, all that information is really important. Oh, um, and then I guess for me, um, learning about uh, these techniques helped me uh, in my next stage of my life because um, I had the opportunity to become a secondary school teacher and I taught design technology to secondary school children. And my, my aim was to really transform uh, my knowledge to, to all these people, uh, to young people in particular. And learn about spices, and um, you know that was a passion that I had, and I was able to do that for so many years, and um, you know allow me to. to yeah. 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 Um, so those are the key things I did, as well. um, and also to that, to um, you know enjoy uh, being with young people uh, and, you know, uh, learning from them as well. So that was quite good. Um, and then there was one part of my life um, when I turned 30, um, I wanted to really explore um, about my background because I was born in Bradford. Um, I used to see these amazing photographs of people, you know, relatives who I've never met. And I think it was an opportunity for me to sort of find out a bit more about myself. So I quit my job as a teacher and dad and I went to India and I began to understand really about who I was, 
where I was from and also about the food uh, because I'm, I'm so interested in it. And the first slide there I'm going to show you and, it, and sort of explain why they're there is uh, two people who really made a big, a big impact um, uh, in my life. Um, the first one is my my mom, Sarita Ben, and she um, she looks like my mom. She cooks like my mom, and every time I went to house, she'd make a, a delicious proper curry, and it was so good. Um, but mainly she spent hours producing this amazing vegetarian food, and you know I realized that what my mom was making was truly authentic, and it was just incredible for men here also to do. Okay just the same. Um, and then obviously um, me and Ben spent some time in the kitchen and chatting and we really got on and I enjoyed being with her. And then part of my journey of going to India was to explore other parts of India and their different heritages and, and their food. And I met this other lady here in the red um, and she was from in Tibet, uh, oh, she's from that culture. And uh, she was in the Himachal Pradesh area in the Cloud Gand. And she was making more and more. And I'd never had more and more before until then. And I realized that our food in India isn't just about the curry. It's all about also steaming food and producing food from different parts of Asia. And it was a melting pot of beautiful ingredients and how other people can actually, you know, um, create different foods. You know, it's just, just incredible and different textures and flavors using similar ingredients and I think I've started to understand about who we are because sitting down on the floor or sitting around the table and enjoying food is something that I really enjoyed and and I think that I learned that a lot when I went to India so these two women really made a big big impact uh, on my life you know at that time and then um there's a, another slide here uh, about me and mum cooking uh we were making that actually that day and from Ripley and uh, we sort of talk about you know all sorts of things when you're cooking uh, mom and i would talk about all sorts of things but i really enjoyed uh you know cooking with mom uh most of my time maybe not in my teenage years because i wanted to go out and be with my friends uh, but i'm very grateful now um but what i did learn is learn the recipes uh, from heart and uh you know uh, learning the skills is so important to me um, and obviously going around India and finding the ultimate curry was my sort of key thing about learning about uh, food and, and its importance. And one of the couple of photos that I wanted to show you that uh, on the bottom left hand side, you can see my mom with my Massey. Uh, that was one of the very first photos that I had in 1967. And, you know, I still love that because, you know, that is how we grew up. We'd go to my Massey's every Saturday and we'd have gorgeous you know, um, anything, anything what Massey would make would be so good. And you can see uh, my sister here, in the, she was only two, I think, at that time. And, and Ma was there. And we would basically, like, you know, really enjoy uh, being together as a family. And uh, I, just, I just loved it very much. Um, and then the other two uh, dishes, uh, the one in the middle, uh, I went to Lily and the taxi drivers, they tend to know where the best food is. And uh, this one in particular, one in the middle, was, I think it was like, I don't know, five, uh, I think it's Noibara or something like that. And I think it cost me like 20 p. Uh, and it tasted incredible. Um, it doesn't look very pretty, but all the different sort of chutneys and things are so tasty. I just loved it. And then I went to a posh hotel up in the, in the Himachal Pradesh. Um, and uh, I went to a hotel and it was in my guidebook to go and I think this is like fish goujons with some dip. I actually didn't like it. I traveled 10,000 miles to actually try this particular dish and I didn't actually like it very much. And I think it's one of the top hotels up there. Uh, so I realized that, you know, I think some of the street food in, in India is the best. And obviously I think the Gujarati uh, curry and uh, street food there is just incredible. So it really, it sort of started opening up my, my world of food uh, during that trip and my journey. and. I just wanted to show you a sort of a, a quick sort of uh, slide here of the different places that I've visited and the type of food that I experienced. And, and, and I said, you know, going up to, to the north to Lily and, and having Janachaf, you know, it's such a cheap and uh, easy uh, dish to produce. And you can feed lots of people with that. But, you know, uh, I thought it was amazing. And 
I always think the Punjabis are really good at making samosas. They're, they're like, you know, they, they're, they're different to ours in the Gujarat. Um, and then obviously I realised in the north they, they grow the wheat, the naan and kebabs and from the Pakistani community and they, feed, they just produce like different different types of um, foods. But also, you know, their spicing is very different. And then obviously I did some voluntary work down in the south in, in Kerala and I was really fortunate to be, you know, be able to have dosa and uh, all these different seafood dishes. And I, I just felt very lucky to be able to be within the community, taste this incredible food, understand about their home life and actually come away with some inspiration. And, you know, I think then when I came home, it was time to do something with it. Um, I hope I'm making you all very hungry. <laughs> Um, and then when I went to India, mum had said to me, you know, when you go to uh, the Gam, you must go to the market because she says you will see vegetables there that are so bright and colourful. And when I did this maybe 20 years ago, you know, I had a very basic camera, but look how bright the colours of all the, uh, all the beans are and even the carrots are purple and not orange and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, Linda was so fresh and lovely and I, I just couldn't believe what how lovely everything was there. You know, unfortunately, we have to import it. And by the time we get it, it's never as colourful as this. But I, I was able to experience it and taste it. And it was just, in, in, it just in, you know, incredible. Um, and then my aim when I went to India was to find the ultimate curry. And uh, Richard, my husband, and I went to um, Goa. And um, I love crab, and um, and I didn't realise how amazing it was until I went to one of the beach shacks there, and it was very cheap food, but it tasted so good. And the chef and I, you know, we chatted, and I saw how he cooked it, and he'd just go to the market and grab a cut crab, and then he would cook something for us, and it tasted so good. I'd have that every day if I could. It was so nice. And then when I came back home uh, to the UK, uh, Rich and I got married and um, we then started, uh, you know, I started looking for work. And I guess this is why, why Shabin has asked me to come and talk to you, because at the minute, lots of people are going through difficult periods in their life. And, and I think I went through this uh, uh, all those years ago. Um, so I went back into do some teaching and um, I was actually made redundant after coming back after securing a job and it was quite a difficult time for me because I was trying to have a family and uh, we found it very difficult to conceive. Um, I realised that I, I wasn't unable to do that after many uh, cycles of IVF and I found it a very dark time in my life and um, yeah so I needed to sort of find something to do. Um, we started running out of money and we bought uh, this farm, um, obviously thinking that we had two incomes to find that there was only one income uh, between us. And during that period, there was very little jobs out there. And I found that, um, um, you know, we, we had about 200 pounds left in my bank account. And I realized that uh, I had to do something about this and, and get up and be positive and do, do something for myself. Um, and you know what? I found that when I had um, amazing friends around me, so one of my friends came and she said, Binny, you're an amazing teacher and you cook fantastic food. You know, um, have you thought about running a cookery school because I have the space? So I looked and I said, yeah, I think I've got the kitchen space and I've got the space outside where can, people can park. And I think it's a really good idea. So I went along to... Um, with the money and I went to Ikea and bought like the cutest things I could afford to do and I I sort of set up a cookery school at home and you know the next thing was like how on earth am I going to get people to come here because I've got these skills I've set up like a business plan and now I need to get people to come along and what I did is I actually went to a ladies networking meeting and they were amazing you know when you're a teacher you have a different language because you're teaching young people when you are surrounded by adults in a business world it's a different language that i had to learn i had to learn what to wear i had to learn how to present myself how to sell a product you know i, I had to learn all these new skills which was actually quite exciting because it was something different but you know at that point i decided that i wasn't going to go back into 
a teaching environment. I was going to take control of my life and, and actually do something really positive. Um, and then when I was at the networking meeting, one of the ladies had said, you know, Vinny, there's something called Twitter. Why don't you set up a Twitter account? I'll do a, you have, you host something here for me. I'll set, set up a Twitter account and then you're on something called social media. And I went, yeah, okay, I don't know what it is, but I had a go. Um, and then when I sort of started using Twitter, I entered a competition called Food Glorious Food and it was on ITV. Um, and I submitted an application and uh, hey presto, um, I ended up representing the Southwest with Lloyd Grossman um, on ITV. And that absolutely transformed my entire life from then once I was on ITV. And Sweet Human became quite famous uh, in our area. And people from all over the world started to come here to learn about Gujarati food. And it's like, wow, this is just, you know, something I didn't expect, but I'm very happy about it. Um, over the last, all those years when I was teaching, I think I taught about 6,000 people. Um, I must have worked very hard seven days a week, um, you know, teaching all these incredible people who wanted to learn about our culture, our, our food, our spicing. And once one person comes, the word goes out. And I just couldn't believe that this was happening for me. Um, at the same time, I have people requesting about having food, you know, like, you know, could they have it at home? So like having ready meals and I went, yeah, you know, I'll just go into the kitchen and cook something. And, you know, my neighbor in particular said, could you do something for my, for my children? Yeah, what do you want? And so the chicken dish, so I did something called mobile chicken curry and, um, and they loved it, you know, because it has creamy, it's creamy, it's got um, almonds in it and it tastes amazing. Um, and then another friend would say, oh, could you do me some vegetarian food? Went, yeah, what do you want? And she loved like binda. So I did binda and a sack for her and uh, other veggie dishes. And I'd meet up with her in Sainsbury's car park in Bath. We'd have a coffee and then we'd go to the car park and exchange curry and money. And that's how I started earning money like that. Um, and then from there, I, I realized the food was quite really good and it tasted good. And I started entering awards. And there is, um, like we have down here, like Taste of the West Awards. And um, we, I won gold awards for everything, which is amazing. And then one year I won the Champion Product Award for the Chicken Classic Curry. And that propelled me up there with all the best people in our region. Uh, and, you know, it was interesting. The people there said, they, I taught them about proper Indian food when they tried it which was amazing because it's not just about Indian food, it's about Gujarati food. And that is what my aim was, is to showcase our dishes. Um, and then when I was at one of the award ceremonies, somebody, somebody said, Vinny, have you thought about the, the Guild of Fine Foods? Now, the Guild of Fine Foods is one of the national and now international sort of awards that you can get. Now, if you get one of them, you know you're up there. And I have 13 of those. It's very difficult to even get one, but every dish of mine has won a great taste award, and, and that's like up there with the best. Um, and also, one of my aims was to I heard about this company called Gloucester Services, they're on the uh, M5 motorway services, and they've got one of the, the best farm shops going. And when you're traveling up north from, from Cornwall, you would, you would go up north and go into Gloucester Services. And I got in touch with them. I, I was quite brave and got in touch directly. And I said, look, I've got these products. Uh, would you like to try them? And so they invited me to do that. And I met Alexander. And, and he, he used to be the head buyer for Harrods uh, for the food. And him and his assistant loved it so much. They said they wanted it. But they said, I have to... Um, Take it out of the kitchen, in my home kitchen, and produce it in an uh, industrial environment. Um, so you can imagine I had £200 to set up a business. Um, and then I then had to find a production unit, set it up, spend the money, and basically go and see them and say, here we go, this is what I've done for you and for me to get my food into the shop. So I spent £35,000 and I took it out of the mortgage and... I decided um, I was going to do it, um, and uh, and that's what I did. 
18 months later, after I set it up and put the team together, I invited Alexander to come and have a look. And you can see the, the picture at the bottom of my production kitchen and what I had to do. Um, I now have, you know, two full-time members of staff who, who support me. I have an assistant who now looks after the admin and, and, that, um, and that sort of thing. And now I supply, you know, Vinnie Fine Food started in 2016 and we're going strong, you know. Um, we supply um, 70 wonderful farm shops across the UK. I mean, honestly, I was cooking at home in a little pan and now, you know, we make like 56,000 curries a year. And, you know, I would never have dreamt that I would be able to do that. And there are times when I've been in the kitchen, I, you know, I've put, you know, a, a week's worth of curry would be 1,200 curries a week. And I'm doing that, you know, and, you know, with my team now, it's just a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, you can find uh, my curries in motorway service and garden centres across the UK. And I just feel very proud about, you know, what I've been able to achieve. Uh, with a lot of grit and determination to do it. And, you know, I, I sort of look back at the things that I've actually um, done over the last sort of 20 years, really, and, you know, 10 years in particular with, with Vinny Fine Foods, and I feel really, uh, you know, supported by who is around me. Um, and Roche Evan yesterday asked me about um, COVID and how that had affected me, and I thought that was quite an interesting question, and then, you know, um, I sort of realised when we were all told to stay at home and nobody could have Indian food, you know, for me, uh, we had to really ramp up production because nobody could go out to a restaurant. And then we were getting inquiries from all over the country, people wanting home cooked food. I only had one single glass freezer. I had to then invest extra money in to buy electronic equipment to cope with the demand of this. It was just incredible what we were uh, able to do um, and, you know, to support our supply chain. And I remember um, one of the uh, companies that helped me distribute the product and they said, Vinny, if your company wasn't going, we would have gone under. And I think from then on, you know, I realised how important what we were doing and also su supporting the, um, you know, my the whole supply chain of, you know, the, the drivers to the producers to the suppliers of the ingredients to the shops and the thousands of um, people who relied upon my food, um, you know, and I guess that propelled, you know, the whole, um, um, you know, Vinny Fine Foods um, name, really. It was just brilliant. Um, but, you know, over that time, we, we've done some incredible things and you know, I met people like uh, Thatcher's Cider. I don't know whether you know about Thatcher's. They are a big um, cider producer here in the Southwest, and we sort of, uh, we work with them. Uh, I got an opportunity to work and develop a range of recipes that went out to every single um, pub and restaurant that's, that they actually stocked their ciders. Um, that project also went to Australia and America. So I was very lucky to be able to work with such a renowned uh, family-run business, uh, which also gave me an opportunity to go on TV again, where I was invited to talk about Indian food and matching ciders. Uh, and I met uh, Greg Wallace uh, and Philippa Forrester. We, we all were uh, asked to you know, showcase what um, local farmers and working with producers like me and the importance of that um, and then, yeah, I mean, the recent sort of other things I've had an opportunity to do was uh, when I was working with Thatcher's, um, the now Duke of Edinburgh and his wife were opened at one of their sites and I was invited to kind of show them what I was doing and uh, I fed them lunch that day and it was quite a surreal experience for me. Uh, but it was, I felt quite honoured that I was able to show them what, what our food's about and, you know, uh, explain to them, you know, the importance of 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 the fancy food and spicing and and obviously, you know, matching up with the local side of this also part of what I've had to do. Um, I also had an opportunity to cook for the ICC World Cup cricket team when they came to Somerset, and you know, I thought really, uh, my dad's a massive cricket fan. I'm not so much, but my dad is, and 
and I wanted, like, you know, to say to Dad that I, I, I managed to do that. And all the, um, uh, they wanted, obviously, halal food for these uh, Pakistan team. There was um, all the other teams there who, I never got a chance to do for India, unfortunately, but uh, the English Indian team, uh, the Bangladesh, I think there was uh, some Caribbean teams there. And five different uh, countries came, and I know I, I supplied them with the food, which was a big honour. Um, for Sweet Team in my cookery school, um, I won the Southwest Tourism Excellence Award, so one of the best uh, cookery schools in the Southwest. So, you know, me at home teaching, I, I wore, had that opportunity to win that. Um, one of the dragons from the Dragon's Den during COVID saw that I was cooking like, you know, 20,000 curries, and uh, he, he sort of allowed me to be part of his small business uh, Sunday group, and I was a winner for that. Um, I know I take in with, uh, with uh, lots of celebrities started finding my food and Howard Donald from Take That tweeted the fact that I was, you know, one of his favourites. And obviously that shared amongst all his super fans, which I was really honoured with. And then I guess the other sort of big one that happened this year, uh, the last year, was um, I was approached by um, a company. Um, it was called the Cotswold Farm Shop, and that was on Channel 4. And, um, and it's actually linked with the Gloucester Services because if I hadn't met Gloucester Services all those years ago, I don't think I would have uh, moved my pre into a new premises. And they were looking for stories that highlighted, um, you know, heritage and food and the importance of that and the steps forward in order to, you know, showcase your, your dishes. And, and that is what I did. You know, I, I got the opportunity to do seven days of filming and um, me and my team were, were part of that. And yeah, um, if you let, get a chance to look at episode three on um, channel four, uh, I think it's on, um, play, you know, can um, play it back, you know, and you can see it and it's called the Cotswold Farm Shop, but it highlights uh, artisan food producers who produce the best produce and how you would get a product into a farm shop like that. It isn't easy to get your food into shops like that. It's something that you need to put a lot of work and effort and dedication to. Um, but yeah, that sort of got, gives you an idea of my story of setting up a business and, and kind of working very hard to produce our food for everybody to enjoy. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've worked very hard and, uh, and the importance of it is is to showcase what what we what we have and our heritage within our food. Yeah. There you go. Then what do you reckon? That was um, so thought provoking and really inspiring um, for me. And I'm sure I speak for many people when I when I say that, uh, Binny. It's amazing how you've turned, as you as you stated, quite a dark time in your life, um, and turned it into so many positive, with a a, a global impact. Um, I think that's what comes through for me. Um, it's uh, the inspiration and the extent of it is really quite formidable. Um, I think we are getting some questions in um if you could possibly stop sharing and switch your yeah. um, camera on perhaps we can begin with a few uh questions there was one question uh from vinod who was asking what's your favorite <laughs> what's your favorite curry bin uh, <laughs> that's my wannabe by the way oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I think my favourite is, I think my new one, it's the goat curry, it's called Gaba Goat Curry, and um, it's a new one that I've, I did for the TV programme, actually. When I went to, uh, that's actually a good one, Manu, um, when I went up to um, Himachal Pradesh, the driver took me to a Gaba, you know, they went there, because I was heading up north, and um, we stopped over to this really, like, I don't know, he's quite a dodgy um, place, you know, it's right on the edge of a cliff, basically, and this guy was cooking these dishes, and the guy said, you know, you need to try this, and I said, what is it? He said, just try it, so I did, and basically, it was goat meat, 
And I went, right, I've never had it before. And it tasted really good, very deep. It was really taste, really, really amazing. Um, and then I've always kept that in my mind. And when I came back to the UK, um, I realized people didn't really eat goats. I know like people in Africa eat it, people in um, you know different parts of the world eat it, but in the UK they don't. And so I decided that when the opportunity came to do the filming for the Channel 4 series, I basically, um, I sort of said, yeah, I'll try it. But it was quite a challenge to find goat meat in this country. But can I say, since the programme, everybody eats it. <laughs> it's very tasty. If you like meat, obviously it's good. But if you don't, you know, it's not for you. But I have a, a, um, a, a chicken dish um, that I developed initially because lots of people eat chicken in this country. Um, probably because they're familiar with it um but also the, the goat meat is now up there with those who enjoy it yeah but that answered the question by the way uh yeah we have uh kamlesh bai who's joined us uh who's the spa uk president uh thank you for joining us uh kamlesh bai lovely to ha to have you here um right so kamlesh bai is asking yeah great inspiring story i i just i did put a message on the chat. So uh, basically, uh, I'm lovely to see you promoted our majority food. I just wanted to know, um, how has the sort of recent cost of living increases recently impacted your business? I know you have to change things. I, I'm an accountant by trade, so it's probably oh, yeah. a question for me. <laughs> but but it's, um, yeah. you know, it's one of the things that uh, yeah. small businesses like you are, are folding because the cost of living increases the electricity gas products so yeah have you had to you know change things or how are you managing with that because that's you know it's really impacting all businesses it um, is. yeah yeah it is it's such a good question i would say that last year especially when um you know when we had the war in ukraine and all that starting i must say it was a massive hit uh for me because obviously everything you saw the pitch in there is all electric you know, we don't have gas there. And um, yeah, it was quite a frightening few, few months, actually. Um, there were times where I had to look at the recipes and think, you know, buying a box of tomatoes. I tell you, I'll give you an example. A box of tomatoes was like six pounds. Um, and then at one point, they went to 20 pounds for the same thing. So that was like, like shocking. But you won't have enough time to plan for that within, within, five days, you know, the pricing would change so quickly, it was really difficult to, uh, you know, keep up with it. I mean, a box of ginger, I mean, getting hold of ginger in COVID was hard, but then we had the, you know, this whole war thing going on, and, you know, a box of ginger went up to £70, when I was paying, like, you know, £20, you know, this was just, this was just, like, quite frightening. So I had to adapt the recipe slightly. So, you know, if I was using fresh tomatoes and obviously there's the tin option and, you know, that was slightly uh, different in its flavor, but then we'd have to adapt the recipe slightly just so that we still retain the authenticity of it, the taste to taste the same, but still make it cost effective. And, you know, I still have to work around what we can get hold of. I mean, COVID, getting hold of ingredients alone was hard. Then obviously now we've got this cost of living. It's it's just frightening. How do you find safe driving, mate? Sorry, so I, I didn't hear that question. No, I think somebody just unmuted them. So, no, thank thank you for that. I think there's a couple of other questions actually before mine. So, uh, uh, Deepak Bai or Rashabin, would you? Uh, okay, so there's another one from Vinod uh, Benemi, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Vinny. How did you find the transition from your kitchen to a commercial kitchen? Oh, yeah. So very good question, Benemi. <laughs> yeah, so it was quite, um, I, I, think I find it quite exciting, actually, to um, to move from from that. You know, you, it's, you know, when you're making curry in a saucepan, and when you're upscaling it to, you know, to make 56,000 in a year, that's a different scale. You know, you're looking at a different scale and you, you know, you've got to think about, 
investing in equipment that's going to be allowing you to do it, do the job. So you have to obviously spend the money to do it. Obviously, then I've got the recipes to upscale. And I, I actually had to do that anyway for, you know, the recent Dab I Don't Curry for the TV programme. And it takes a long time to actually upscale and get those recipes to absolute perfection. So when you've got it, you've got your perfect recipe and you can carry on doing it. Um, and I think a lot of it is trial and error, but I found it quite an exciting time to actually go from the home kitchen and also, you know, to make it work. You know, you, you have it in you to to be entrepreneurial and do it because that's what you have to do. You know, when you have got nothing and you basically, you know, you have to rely upon this because you've invested quite a lot of money, you don't want it to fail. You want it to mm-hmm. succeed. And, and I actually think that, all the draughties we are that you know we are those kind of people where you know mum and dad have you know <laughs> told us we have to it's, in, it's embedded in us to be successful to do it and and I think that is why I felt that I had to do it not you know for me and for you know for the community I work with you know I, you know, I work with lots of people I support a lot of families and I've got a responsibility to make sure that you know their families are fed and and you know we've got wages to take home but that that transition was good but it's scary at the same time that you just have to be brave don't you and go for it and I say that to anybody who wants to do something you know you know who's stopping you is it you because if it's you then you basically need to just change your mindset (laughs) Ah, that's that's really motivating um and uh does does really give you the the gusto you need to crack on with your ideas and somebody who's echoing that is n mystery um it says hi Binny. you're so inspiring you've spoken about the last 10 20 years what are your plans for the next 10 years oh good question so i think one one of the key things i've always wanted mm-hmm. to do is actually write a book um i feel like i need to record what i've got uh, and then obviously, you know, sell a cookbook to do with the draft of food. I know you can get them. I know YouTube okay. and, you know, all those videos are there. But I feel, I'm still quite old fashioned and I feel like I need to write this book before all the recipes are forgotten. Um, so I'd love to write a, a, you know, publish a book and get our the draft of food out there. Um, and I think one of the other things I want to do is also sell my food internationally. Um, I've always had the inspiration to do it, but it's just finding how to do it. And, you know, I, I hope that I will find a partner to, you know, sell sell it um, abroad. Uh, you know, I work alongside the Department of Trade of Industry at the minute, and where we are looking at ways to actually do it. And I know it will happen. It's just when. <laughs> you uh, know, it's just one of those things. But it will. I do believe it will happen, and, and I, I'll, I will hope that I can do that. So international and a book. And that's what I want to do. And travel a lot more. And get some more inspiration. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it is really important to preserve those legacies. I mean, as you mentioned, like our mothers, they just cook just by eyeballing, by sight. They don't really write anything down. And um, you know, it's I guess it's at, at the age of seven that you are able to replicate that. It's something because, uh, yeah, unless things are written down for me, I struggle. I would really struggle to cook things. So you clearly have a flair for this um, from a really, really young age. Um, there is another another question. Oh, sorry. This is another one. Are you asking another question? <laughs> Actually, I have one. So. During, during COVID, I found it incredibly difficult to um, access things like curry leaves. And so I'm just wondering, like your business actually flourished um, during COVID and you were able to, um, you know, uh, provide a livelihood for people when a lot of people were actually losing their jobs. So, I mean, that, that's incredibly important. Um, so how were you able to access everything you needed um, during the lockdowns? Because there were no flights um, to these tropical places. And so how, how did you survive that, that yeah. difficult time? Yeah, I mean, looking back at the COVID period, that was quite a challenge, actually. And, you know, um, I think when you've got a good supply chain behind you, and if you've got an established supply chain, you have to tap into that. And that's where the whole relationship building works. 
So, you know, you you start to dig in and start to find where you can get hold of those curry leaves and say, you know, um, so for example, I would go into Bristol and, and go to some, a place called Bristol Sweet Mart and they've got like dry curry leaves and you would have to adapt not using fresh and you'd have to go down the dry route because getting hold of them would be very difficult, you know. I mean, if I had a choice, I would like convert my front paddock into a coriander farm because quite frankly, I needed so much coriander, curry leaves and potatoes and onions and that sort of thing. I would just do it now. <laughs> Um, but um, but yeah, I think using your contacts and using your supply chain is the key thing. And, um, you know, having those relationships with people and knowing where to get hold of those in advance is always important. Um, and then, you know, you just pick up the phone and people are there for you, as I was for other people. And I think that's where that community was there. You know, um, I didn't mention that, you know, I was one of the vulnerable people yeah. who was asked to stay at home. And, I found that quite challenging uh, because obviously I wasn't allowed to leave house and still expected to go, you know, I had to run a business. Luckily, I had Harry. Uh, Harry was with me for four years and he was at ex army and he was 60, I think I mentioned 66. Um, and he basically ran that kitchen on his own whilst I was peeling potatoes at home and he was cooking it. And between us, we had to supply all the shops that we had where Richard would be driving between them to do all the the sort of driving between us. It was just kind of bizarre, you know, and we had to have those kind of logistics just within our own little network. And obviously then we had to go out and, and grab ingredients whenever we possibly could using our, our shop. You know, it was quite a challenging time, but we managed it. And, you know, again, that little bit of bit and determination would with, you know, make you, you just do it. You know, you, you just have to. You just feel like you have to provide a meal. And and I think I mentioned earlier that you know people were getting in touch with with me from across the country to supply them food. I tell you, I had one guy who's a doctor working in the NHS, and he said that he was desperate to have some traditional food, uh, and he was working these shifts in the hospital, and you know, and all the nurses and. And that sort of thing. And I realised that my food was very important because it wasn't just for feeding. It was, you know, it was for people like those guys who were saving lives. And actually, you know, um, you know, I realised, you know, I needed to do this because it wasn't just about running a small business here in Somerset. It was providing a proper meal for people to save lives in hospitals. And, and that kind of story for me was... You know, and I guess being one of those who had to be at home, you know, I needed those guys to be able to, to do their job because it allowed me to be where I am and, to, and save lots of lives. So, you know, it, it's not just about cooking curry, it was about saving lives as well. It was bigger. The picture was a lot bigger than, than what, what I realised, you know. It was a big, big, big thing. But yeah, we, we finally got the curry leaves just to let you know. We did get them. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I had to fight for them, though. That's the thing. <laughs> it was the same in in many places over the curry, over the curry leaves, and I think we all, we all learned to grow coriander at that time. So uh, it was a, it was a tough. It was. Time. And I think we are all going through really tough times with businesses. Even now, you know, you hear it. You know that we're all going through challenging times. But you know what? I think if you Got a, got a strategy and a you know you have your network you can make things work whatever it is whatever your idea is you know I, I do believe that you can you can do anything if you put your mind to it it's just the will to do it and you know you get up and get on with it and that's what I still carry on doing you know you just have your team and you build it and and make it work um. well done yes uh, so we have one uh, uh, which says uh, I can't see who it's from, but it says, hi, Binny, I do run the restaurant at the moment and it's awarded best restaurant uh, in the north, I think, uh, North Yorkshire for the last two years in a row. I'm very pleased, but everything has gone up three times and it's expensive to run in the food business. What are your, what is your opinion? What are your thoughts? Mm, yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? Um, I suppose we've got the wages and things like that, as I have. 
And I think um, you would have to look at your business plan. You would have to look at all your costings. And that's what I had to do and look at where you can save wherever you possibly can. You may have to streamline what you do and, you know, perhaps, um, you know, do slight adjustments to your menus and things like that. Uh, I know people down here are reducing the number of days that they do their sort of, um, you know, their days of work, you know, perhaps look at the quieter days might be Mondays. And I know lots of chefs have days off on Mondays uh, yeah. and Tuesdays, and even some people have it on Wednesdays, and they then be, bring up, you know, have more work on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, you know, and really focus on those days. And, and I think the hospitality industry is having a, a really tough time out there. And, you know, my heart goes out to anybody who is struggling with that. But I, my, I think for those guys who are there, they're going to have to go back to the books and perhaps see an accountant and have a look at where they can streamline or uh, reduce some of their costings by, I don't know, maybe tweaking, not putting as much, of, you know, different ingredients in that perhaps are costing so much money and just reducing it a little bit. And I'm sure they're doing that. Um, and the last thing you want to do is start doing redundancy and that sort of thing, because that's heartbreaking. But, you know, there might be times when you might have to do, I don't know, part-time working, you know, do that sort of thing. I, I just don't know. I mean, for me, I, I really had to go back down to looking at the cost and seeing where I can save the money. And that's where I did it, rather than putting people um, in the redundancy form. I did it in the sense of let's look at the recipes and look at the production and see how I can make, make cost savings like that. And I, it's interesting, I did actually have a, a conversation with a specialist in the manufacturing industry, and they were talking about how to save money with electricity. And if your freezers, for example, are very well sealed, then you would be able to switch off your freezer for about an hour or so, and food will still stay um, frozen for quite a long time, and then you can switch off. So you, if I have you know, a lot of freezers there, and we had to kind of do that. Frozen products are quite good. They kind of hold their temperature. But when you've got a frig, I suppose, that's a very different situation, especially if you're storing meat and things like that. You know, you, you can't do it with that. But a frozen product, you would. So I think perhaps um, getting in some advice, I think, from a, some, from the, perhaps from the council, perhaps they might have um, uh, mentors that could help you with, um, you know, support with how you can streamline your, your business might be worth looking at and and I guess that's what I had you know during COVID to see how I can how it can help with us in manufacture and perhaps I might have somebody like that in the hospitality industry I don't know but I know a lot of lot of lot of businesses are, are finding it challenging. Okay thank you some really useful suggestions for um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Bless. Uh, yes, yeah, some really useful solutions for people at home, as well as um, those in the uh, professional catering uh, trade. Uh, Vinny, um, as, as a woman um, who is now um, managing people, um, how an ex-army at that, one burning question I have is, how did, um, how do ex-army people who are obviously used to being managed uh, in quite a stern way H how do they respond to being managed by somebody who's just incredibly gentle and sweet like you I mean did you have to like shout a lot or yeah. like, how did you make it work yeah so Harry um, yeah because he he worked um, in lots of catering industry you know he he told me CV Life, they call it CV Life, don't they? And they have a very different um, life before they leave the army. And you're right, you know, they're basically told what to do every day. They have to line up and do all of that. And I don't think we appreciate that kind of regimented life that these guys have to live in. And they have to then come out of that. And then they can do what they want. They are very lost. And that is what happens. They are very lost people. And... So when he eventually came to me through a friend, um, you know, he, he had the right attitude to work. And I think they have a very good regimented way of working. So for manufacturing, when you day in, day out, you're doing the, the same job all the time, you know, the preparation and all of that, 
it's good because it's a routine. It's when mm. you take that routine away, you know, they kind of get a little bit lost. And luckily for Harry, from with, when he was with me for four years, you know, he's able to have a routine so that helps him. And then I guess with, with me and Harry, I guess, you know, it's very different for him because I wasn't going to shout at him because, quite frankly, you know, it's just not how you manage people. You know, you don't manage people like that. And I think you just need to show people like that, that life outside isn't, you know, it is it is calmer. It doesn't have to be a shouty thing. And then actually when Harry did leave me, um, he actually, his dream was to go and play cricket for the senior team for Somerset County. And he did it. And it was a really lovely thing for him to retire and do. And I know that he still plays for the senior team for the over 70s. Um, and he enjoys, you know, um, playing cricket and, and being with other civvies, you know, that's what, what he enjoys doing. But yeah, I think people realise that they come out from one industry and I guess the military is something very regimented into the normal uh, civil life and it, it can be quite challenging and he would talk to me about his life in the army and, and how different it was and uh, some other stories you know that were personal but um but yeah okay. it is different but you just have to treat them like a human because that's who they are you know they're people they have feelings uh, no. and like just uh, uh, as as a general um tip what like, is, what is, what is, what what do you think is key to getting the best out of people? Um, I could see how much you're producing. So it's a lot of um, physical and um, concentrated uh, concentration required. Um, yeah. So how do you motivate? And um, obviously things have to be quite exact to yeah. reproduce the same thing again and again. Like, uh, what, what is the secret to, to oh, motivate? Yeah. Well, I'm going to start with a really good question then. Um, you know, um, I think you have to start off with a, a really good recipe. I think once you've got that sort of thing, then obviously once you've achieved what you need to do um, is to upscale to whatever volume you're going to do. Once you've got that, then you can teach the people how to do it. And I guess with my background being a teacher, I was able to show them how how the traditional techniques are done and how to do a regard and you know, what you need to look for when you're doing certain techniques, you know, whatever the stages are. You know, and there were, my chefs have been very lucky that I've been able to show them how to do it, you know, firsthand. I had people across the world who came to learn how to cook curry with me, you know, and, you know, I think that's to, to be able to um, get it right all the time, you know, I've got to be there to show them what to do. And once they know what to do and I have to give them trust to do it, I can lead them and, that's, that's been challenging for me, you know, to let go because when you've got a business and you built it up from really nothing, it's uh, it's letting go has been the challenge, but I, I am getting there. <laughs> ah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> I'm learning, so. <laughs> well, we've learned a lot from you today. Uh, Thank you. Do we have any more questions uh, before we let Binny go? Um, uh, we've got a few more minutes with her. Um, gosh, I found it um, really, really interesting um, hearing about your journey. I'm sure um, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not alone, but um, what, what would you say you're producing at the moment in terms of ready meal per year, say? Um, right, yeah, so we are aiming for 56,000 this year. So we're aiming for that sort of volume. I mean, we're quite small compared to the big players out there. And we we sort of, you know, we do our very best. Um, I feel really lucky that I've been able to stop into some of the most amazing shops across the UK, you know. And when I was on the TV, um, I managed to get into Tea Bay Services, one of the best farm shops on the motorway services at North. So if ever you go to the Lake District, there's something called Tea Bay Services. And I, I can't, you know, I'm in the north and south side. Uh, which is amazing, and they also have some another one called Cairn Lodging up in Scotland. Uh, I mean, that's I mean, every single Westmoreland group of um shop, you know, just incredible because I tell you, then it's so hard to get into those. Uh, and but to be able for our Gujarati food to be in there, it's like you know, we're, we're championing what we're doing, and I think it's so important. Um, but that's something I haven't mentioned is about um women entrepreneurship and 
Do you know what? When I first started doing this, a lot of the women who I met, uh, especially those who helped me propel to where I am now, you know, the, it's, it was like boosting my confidence. You know, I talked about being in quite a dark place and bringing myself up to that. You know, these ladies sort of held me and brought me up to where I am now. You know, and we still get together as, as a group and we, you know, we always talk about how we are and they always want to know what is going on. And, you know, I feel like our community are really good for that. Our ladies are really good when it comes down to, you know, supporting each other. And I think it's so important. But, you know, I think a lot of Indian girls or women out there who want to do something for themselves have got to go off and do it, you know, and, and, and be brave because I think a lot of it is to do with confidence. And, you know, once I got my confidence, look where I am now, you know, I was able to do what I am. And I think when I, I did some work with the uh, Federation of Small Businesses because I was on a national task force for them uh, to look at how we can connect women together to, you know, share stories. But also, if you have an idea, how do you get it out there to to, to make any money and be successful? And, and I, I feel that perhaps, you know, women in our community, I'm sure they're doing it, Perhaps we need to talk about it a little bit more and champion what we do. Not just women, but men as well, but we need to do it for women too. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, lots to think lots to think about there. And um, I just uh, I just feel like your your uh, energies and your hopes uh, are really, really infectious. <laughs> and hopefully if anyone's got any passions, they'll take them forward um, after hearing about your journey today. You really feel I, I really feel like you can do anything after listening to you. <laughs> so thank you for making time to be with us. Kamlesh by any any comments from you? No, uh, thank you, Vinny, uh, 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 for your for your story. Very inspiring. I'm sure. Um, hopefully, you'll get more and more success as well, and and do come back again. Hopefully, in a, in a few years' time, to you know, share your experiences again. But uh, thank you very much. And I think um, we just need to promote um, just generally our, our you know our our, our Gujarat people at, and our Samaj and stuff, and people who've done extraordinary things in in the face of adversity as well. So. It's great that we can do this and share share that. It's I, I believe it's been recorded, it isn't it? Um Russia Benham So uh I've been it for you. It's on this will be on our website as well. So uh, I know I I we have a youth group as well. So we did have sort of careers um events with them. So we'll put this on the website and, and I know a few people who couldn't uh make it today will obviously be, um look at the recording as well so uh, that, that, thank you very much for, for everything you've done today perfect it's my pleasure i really enjoyed it and i just hope it changes somebody's life like it changed mine you know and i think sometimes you just need to listen to others who've gone through things and have hope that you can actually do something positive as well i really hope it helps somebody yeah and, and i think um, whilst i can remember i mean you're in the southwest and i know our so, uh, is really based along you know the, the sort of 14 branches in the sort of main London Leicester Birmingham stuff but we know our you know our, our, our people are throughout the country as well so if you know other projectity members in your area and stuff do um, ask them to join our zoom sessions maybe you can set up a, a Somerset branch of ours or something like that <laughs> in the future I will you know let worship and talk to you about that <laughs> we, we really do want to get to people from outside our, our main regions as well, because a lot of our Project Party members, you know, live outside the country, you know, in the southwest or north, you know, elsewhere. So it's great to hear from people, you know, just not from from the main regions as well, because we we know people, you know, you guys are out everywhere throughout the country. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we live in the middle of nowhere, and we are here just getting connected with everybody again. I think this is a great opportunity, you know, and. You know, I, I think you know we could do that in different ways, and I'll share some um, some ideas with Roshaben for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mark, would you like to say any few words or anything? No, no, just a, a good, inspire, a great, inspiring story, uh, Vinny. Uh, and uh, I think um, you know people listening in. I think the big thing here is never give up and keep you know work hard and and achievements really. So I think um, you know it was a really uh, worthwhile discussion and worthwhile topic today. 
Thank you. I hope it helps people. Thank you. Thank you for having me anyway. <laughs> Thank you for making the time with us. Uh, would you like to say our closing prayers? Yeah. Just and everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks, Vinny, for your presentation and inspiring story. Uh, I'll just close up with a prayer. Asatyo Maheti Prabhupada Masatyo Lehi